So let's start with the second talk. Uh, we are already the second minute in, so very precise. Also, did you notice that Nikita actually finished uh, within 10 seconds of his allocated time? So this is super awesome. Uh, but uh, now, Marti Darama uh, from Fortumo will talk about stuff and things. Uh, we'll talk about logging and, uh, and more on that from himself. So thank you, Marti. Hey guys, I hope you are having a good time. I'm Marty and uh, I'm going to talk about structured logging. <coughs> so every day a vast amount of uh, lines <coughs> is being logged by software and uh, very few of them will be ever read by humans. Although yet many of them are formatted to be readable by humans. And then running some kind of analytics on top of that uh, log is going to prove uh, a handful. There will be a lot of custom parsing. Uh, so what about logging into a machine readable format from right from the start instead? Something like this perhaps. Uh, and for human readers, you can always convert to the human readable format later on, if you, if you really need to. Uh, first, let's go back to 2013. It was a dark November night. <laughs> there was no wind, so everything was calm and peaceful. Except for Fortumo's uh, application server on AVS, which uh, alerted us uh, about growing queue of payments. And the amount of uh, information that was uh, collected for those alerts was not uh, uh, enough for uh, doing a full investigation on what happened. So we had to go and uh, log on to the application server tail and grab the log files and uh, our piped command lines were so long that if you would attach them all together you would cover the distance to the moon. <laughs> uh, and these long piped command lines performed well in very limited scenarios. If you had a new kind of problem, if you if you introduced more servers to your distributed system, you were in, in uh, trouble. And uh, another thing, we also needed to share this inve investigation, the information uh, uh, with other engineers and people outside of the engineering team. Uh, thus, a very simple stat lo stats logger with craft output was born. It was based on uh, Fluent, it was based on Elasticsearch and, and for graphing Kibana. And this was the beginning of structured logging in Fortumo, <coughs> although at that ta time we didn't really talk or think about structured logging. We just saw that this um, visualized, centralized approach works for us and we wanted to have more. So we went and started to forward some of the existing uh, plain text logs into a central logstash server where we uh, attempted to convert them to machine readable format using croc expressions. Uh, these are regular expressions that use match groups uh, to extract <coughs> structured data. But uh, time-consuming task of uh, writing those expressions <coughs> and maintaining those expressions made you cry in Spanish. Like, <laughs> imagine if you take this and it's written by someone else and you have to change it and you cannot break it because production log pipeline would break. And in contrast, uh, we found that adding those structured log lines to some of our application, existing applications even, 
it's extra work, sure, but uh, it's still fairly straightforward. And um, well, processing, filtering, uh, graphing, it's that simple if you have it already structured. And it did not take us long to realize what, which of these paths, like crocking or structured logging, uh, will work for us. So at some point, the decision was made uh, to log only to structured format in the future projects. So no plain text logs anymore. So from Fluent, <coughs> Elastic Short Skibana combo, we went to classic uh, Elk stack, that's Elasticsearch log stash Kibana. Then we added log stash forwarder, a lightweight forwarding component. Log stash forwarder was then replaced by file beat. And we also added gray log for alerting purposes. And today, almost uh, four years later, we have, uh, we produce about 50 gigabytes of logs every day. We have about 5 billion documents in our log storage. We have 81 dashboards, or maybe yesterday we had 81, today probably a bit more. And uh, we have fun, um, about uh, 150 alert streams. Some of them may be test streams, I guess. So, uh, what's also nice is that uh, the dashboards that we produce based on the logs are used all around the company, not only in the engineering. And uh, there are even dashboards that are being maintained by people that are not engineers. They are outside of the engineering teams. Uh, plus, we are getting uh, uh, feedback from partners that we often discover the problems with partners platform before they do because of our uh, diagnostic ability and, uh, and alert alerting and such. So, go and put up your structured logging pipeline and it's smooth sailing from that point on, right? Of course not. So it's cloud again. <laughs> if you, before you can even start with a widespread of adoption of structured logging, you must get your company on board. Not everyone will like this new kind of uh, fancy logging that renders your command line pipes useless and makes log files harder to read. Not everyone will want to put uh, precious uh, engineering resource into developing clusters that uh, have instances that cost a lot of money Come on, we already have logs. So, luckily in Fortumo, this kind of uh, change is uh, uh, accepted or even encouraged. Uh, so, we didn't have that much resistance with our uh, structured logging project. And uh, what I would, would recommend to you is that uh, start from the proof. Star start by proving on some fixed problem that structured logging solves this problem better than the existing plain text logging or better yet, if you can s show that uh, structured logging will solve problems that uh, the old style logging couldn't solve. So if you can do that, then you can put uh, more effort into developing the actual production logging pipeline. And as for the command line enthusiasts, actually you can use the same tool set on structured logs as well. When you introduce the nifty uh, utility called JQ, then there's a great chance that the developers will forget about the old style of logging quite soon. Uh, now, even when your log messages are uh, structured, <coughs> in a structured format, in JSON perhaps, uh, you still would need a common schema, otherwise the log messages would be rather useless or hard to uh, 
parse, uh, not, not to parse, but uh, hard to utilize. And for that reason, we have uh, fixed our top level schema of the log messages and adhering that schema. This is uh, ensured by our own logging libraries, uh, which have been uh, written on top of popular logging libraries like log4j, for Java, or yell for Ruby. Uh, so you, you really cannot log in such a way that the top level schema would be different from, from the schema that we have uh, agreed on. And um, uh, for the uh, deeper levels of the schema, or the like, top level is fixed in JSON, but the inner objects, for those we have given uh, not complete freedom, but a lot of freedom. So uh, this freedom kind of becomes a power to do great things, but as you know, like, with great power comes great fun of abusing the power. <laughs> and um, yeah, you have this power and speed when de <coughs> developing the, and logging and analyzing, but um, you must always keep in mind that whenever you hear schemaless outside of logging or in case of logging, schemaless actually means that schema, the, the responsibility of keeping the schema is on you, not on, on the system. And uh, well, if you fail, you can blame you can blame everyone else, but you wouldn't take, uh, go and fix your pro problem. So, uh, I have to say that over the years we have seen uh, our fair share of uh, Elasticsearch mapping conflicts. An El Elasticsearch schema is called mapping. Uh, one example. I think it's favorite of the full Fortimo engineering team, or at least it happens a lot. Take HTTP response code. Some applications log it down as integer. Some applications log it down as string. If you have the same field name, you have a mapping conflict. Now, if you want to filter or uh, aggregate based on that HTTP response code, you are out of luck because half of your messages will not be accessible for aggregation and filtering. Uh, whichever message came first in the, on the day, it will win the mapping war and the other one will be disregarded. Or if it's in a different Elasticsearch index, it's not disregarded, but you can still use it for filters and aggregations if you do it over the indices. Another example involves all kinds of uh, dates and timestamps. They can be mapped to Elasticsearch internal type called date. They can be mapped to strings. They can, even if you have Unix epoch format, you, you can map them to integers. And yeah, if you use the same field name, boom, there's another schema conflict. But it all kind of uh, pales in comparison to the <coughs> conflict which you have bit, uh, like, uh, between string and uh, inner object in JSON. If your JSON logs are deep enough, have deep, uh, like four levels or so, then you can pretty much uh, count on that for every logging conflict that you resolve, you have, will have two extra or that's what happened to us. <coughs> and in order to get us ourselves out of this mess, uh, we kind of implemented uh, a series of changes over the time. First, we started using dedicated indices for all the applications or microservices. So every one of these can have their own mapping. Of course, when you need to search across the indices, you will, would still have to have matching types everywhere, but only the, they are, the need is limited to the fields that you use for aggregation or 
filtering. If you don't want to use them, then the uh, mappings can differ a bit. Uh, as for the deep objects, we introduced a flattener, and it has proved to be somewhat successful. What flattener does is it takes like nested, it's not nested JSON, but uh, JSON with deeper levels. Uh, it takes it and uh, flattens the fields. Elasticsearch actually does the same, it flattens the documents that you store. But when you do it yourself, you have more control. And this helped us up, uh, out of the string versus object mapping conflict. Uh, we also have uh, used some soft approaches like uh, getting people together, together and agreeing on what types should uh, some common fields have. And a little bit harder approach where you just make Jira tickets, go and fix the mapping, go and fix that. This is wrong. We also introduced a tool that can process your logs uh, before they are sent into Elasticsearch, so you could test while, you're, while you are developing. And uh, this tool kind of uh, uh, detected the potential mapping conflicts and listed them out. Uh, now, when, when I was preparing for this presentation, I went through all the mapping conflicts that we currently have in production stack, and I must say, I was pleased. Many of them were, or there were not many of them, but most of them were uh, minor and uh, no, not a showstopper. But uh, the good old HTTP response code conflict was there again. Like <laughs> What's going on, guys? <coughs> I, I thought we agreed it was a string. No, I thought it was an integer. <laughs> um, from time to time, when you do some investigation in Kibana, <coughs> go, going through maybe some raw log messages, you will go like, oh, wow, like this, this thing shouldn't be there. And uh, yeah, we embarrassingly, <laughs> we have found over the years, we have found private keys, we have found HTTP basic out passwords, all other kinds of secrets in the logs that should have no business being there. What probably happened is someone just took an object that they were at the code working on, serialized it and logged it down because it's easier to log that way. You don't compose a new object, but serialize the existing one and looks good. Or m maybe they thought that it's good for debugging purposes. And by the way, for debugging, I recommend having unique names for secrets and logging down those instead. This is where we are trying to move towards. Um, another case, which I remember very well because I had to deal with the uh, consequences is uh, using uh, unique uh, identifiers as keys in JSON logs. One day, searches on our Elasticsearch cluster started to slow down. And by noon of the same day, the cluster was practically dead, super slow with searching. We narrowed it down to a specific application, then got the idea to look into the mappings and wow, this application has had been just released on this morning and it started to log down payment identifiers, unique identifiers as keys in the log. And even back then, uh, a couple of years ago, probably 2014, even back then Fortumo processed hundred, hundreds of thousand payments per day. and. Uh, by the time we got to the mapping, it was uh, 180,000 uh, fields there. Uh, to give you some perspective, old elastic sources didn't have mapping cap. The modern ones, modern versions too, and the mapping cap defaults to 1,000 
entries per mapping. And I think it's a sensible default, but yet yeah, we had 180,000. And by the way, Elasticsearch died at 180,000, but Kibana died at 30,000. Your laptop would just melt when you opened Kibana with that, that application. So, uh, and the situ this situation is called uh, uh, schema explosion. And um, following that up with another story about uh, how log lines can be a bit too long sometimes, it started the same way. Uh, not exactly the search performance was fine, but uh, the log ingestion started to slow down, meaning logs just didn't accept the data as fast as it should be, but there didn't appear to be any increase in the, in the log volumes. After investigation, again, narrowed it down to a component that is called Notifier. And what Notifier do, does in uh, Fortumo is uh, it sends callbacks to our clients and partners. And partners usually respond with 200, okay, callback received, all, all good. Notifier <coughs> logs the response down and goes on to process uh, the next callback. But when we looked at the Notifier machine, Logster's forwarder was stuck on one line. And it was 85 megabytes long. <laughs> and it appears that one of the merchants had responded to our callback with something that appeared to be an MPG4 video. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine that... I didn't look at the video, honestly. I can imagine that it was the merchant saying, thanks for your callback, <laughs> you received it. So, two days later, we re uh, released a new version of our logging libraries that started to reject the messages that had the length uh, over some barrier. And also, uh, we now like emphasize that it's the responsibility of application to uh, uh, take those uh, fields that are uh, susceptible of uh, oversize and truncate them when needed or or uh, at least uh, indicate that this shouldn't be that long, with exception. It depends on the application. <coughs> so, you may or may not have noticed that we have several wall-mounted screens in our office, on all the floors, all the teams. And during the usual business day, these rotate through a selection of Kibana dashboards that are currently relevant. It often happens that people discover uh, ongoing incidents by just walking by the, by the screens and looking at the dashboards and going, guys, come look, what's, what's this? So, uh, uh, while this is, this is a good thing that you discover incidents, actually it shouldn't be the main way how you understand that you have ongoing issues. Maybe computers would be able to find them for you. That's why we uh, send our logs to the alerting <coughs> component as well and after some tests we uh, <coughs> selected Greylog for our, to, to do our alerting. Greylog can do dashboards as well, but the kind of, for us, doesn't work as, as well as uh, Kibana does. Maybe a matter of taste, but for alerting, it's fine at least, if not good. Uh, it doesn't have very uh, uh, advanced toolset for uh, alerting, at least out, right out of the box, the alerting rules can be 
pretty simple. But it turned out that just simply counting and uh, matching your log lines sometimes, or in most of the cases even, is enough. Uh, and another nice thing about Graylog is that uh, we now have not only engineering level or technical alerts in Graylog, we also have uh, business level alerts in Graylog. And these are being maintained by people who are not in the engineering team. Uh, the creation of new alerts, new streams, has gotten so easy that you sometimes can overload yourself with the alerts. And we also have managed to overload Graylog itself by uh, uh, creating some rules with ridiculously, ridiculously um, inefficient uh, regular expressions that happen to work on a stream with, which has uh, like thousands of uh, log messages per second. But it's fine because we have alert on Graylog overload too. So <laughs> once you get those alerts, something maybe via Slack, maybe via I don't know, email, you know, that used to be such a communication. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so if you get something like this, you will probably go back to Kibana, or not, maybe not back to Kibana, but you will probably go to Kibana and start to investigate. And when you have microservices, then the, some random web request can traverse a lot of microservices. Each of them logs in their separate way. Each of them uh, provides the information that, it's, that is uh, relevant to the microservice in the logs. And could be a pretty hard task to go through all of these. But there's a simple solution to at least the Correlation issue, you can use correlation IDs. What it is or what it means is that you take uh, an incoming request and on the edge of your services, when you first receive it from the outside world, you will attach a uh, correlation ID, you will pass it on as metadata and everyone, every service that sees this request will uh, lock down the metadata as well. Then you take the correlation ID from the request, enter it to Kiba into Kibana, and boom, you have all the services, all the logs of the services that have seen this request. You can even do some kind of poor man's uh, performance investigation because the timestamps are also there. You, you can see where the time was spent on this request. And another nice bonus is that um, the operations people can uh, use this system to track down payments. What's the payment flow? Where did it fail? Why did it fail? Uh, but now, I'm changing the topic a bit before the end. Some of you may be interested in the cost of this structured logging pipeline. And I have to admit that it costs a lot. It costs a lot of uh, money for infrastructure because if you want to have a production worthy log processing pipeline, it has to be highly available, it has to perform really well, it will get it will have to grow with the load of your services that send logs to it. And also it costs quite a lot of engineering time because uh, there will be engineers who are, ha, are responsible for maintaining that logging infrastructure and they have to keep themselves up to date uh, with the latest and greatest. Uh, I would say that uh, money-wise or infrastructure-wise we spend around 5 to 10 percent of our entire in infrastructure budget on the logging infrastructure. Uh, but if it wouldn't be 
valuable to us, we wouldn't actually we wouldn't do it. So we are quite uh, like uh, confident that we are getting the value back from the logging infra. And uh, remember that, or like the, the first the second slide when where we had this orange graph, this one didn't cost five percent of uh, infrastructure budget. In fact, it didn't cost uh, any infrastructure money at all because it was run on existing infra. And as for the developer time, I think one day or something like this. So uh, you can start small and simple. You don't have to go mad. You don't have to do this 50 gigabyte logging. I'm not sure even if we do, but it's hard to hard to stop when you are doing. <laughs> <coughs> so how would I wrap it up? I'm not trying to say that you cannot have centralized, visualized <coughs> logs with search cap capabilities and alerts without doing structured logging. Of course you can, but giving our logs some structure has certainly worked out very well for Fortumo. And uh, earlier I might have said that structured logging is all about replacing human readable logs with machine readable logs. It's very ironic because after we did it, we have had more human eyes on, on our logs than ever before. Yeah, yeah, okay, they, they are probably looking at the graphs, not the raw messages, but even the raw messages get more attention than, than they did before. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> one remark, one remark. We have this networking thing coming, coming up. And please feel free to contact me or Martin Rose or uh, Bauer Deller uh, to talk about uh, structured logging if you have some specific co questions you want to go deeper with schema mapping conflicts. <laughs> You're welcome. I will be here until all the questions have been answered. <laughs> <laughs> what you do? With, with this bold promise from Marty, I would still, if there aren't any, any bigger questions, general questions. The uh, general right ones, now. go ahead. How is it? Is it is it to get started? <coughs> is it like well supported uh, approach, like industry best practice, or are you, are you more on the fringe? There? Nowadays, I would say it is supported <laughs> quite well because I can talk from our experience. We are using ElkStack, and if you take Elasticsearch logs to Skibana, that that stack in 2013 versus today. I have to say the Elastic Corporation has done a great job. It is joy to match compared to the old old version of the stack. And uh, as for the JSON format, it's all already also everywhere. It's it's a very little effort to get started in that sense, but to the effort of going to production with it, yeah, I think it's still a bit, bit annoying. You, you don't have any any real reference out there. Have to invent some things on your own. Maybe fun, but uh, <laughs> it's not fun when it fails in production. I just want to say that if you're getting started, you can actually go to logs.io and test it out there. Yeah. It also uses Elk stack and it is super easy to set up. You don't have to set up any servers. You just uh, set up file uh, file stash, and that's pretty, pretty much it. Sorry, you are talking about Elk stack, but uh, I didn't get. I was still using Logstash or not? Logstash is used as a central aggregation point, okay. not for shipping. We have. I think we have never used Logstash for shipping. We use it for receiving and we cannot 
uh, at the moment we cannot start from uh, to send data from file bit directly to Elastic, which is now possible because we have this uh, nifty set of rules in Logstash. And that, that's the op official uh, standpoint of Elastic Corporation as well, <coughs> that if you want to have those kinds of rules, use Logstash, if not, don't use Logstash. Do you have any recommendations for smaller and, smaller and uh, more lightweight logging solutions when you don't want to buy 60 gigabyte machine? Well, like Preet says, there are n said, there are a number of uh, companies that offer uh, something like this as a service. I believe even Amazon has a full Elasticsearch Logstash Kibana stack available and uh, probably cannot run them on T2 micros, but uh, <coughs> for starting you don't need that much. I'm not sure if Amazon approach is cheaper. Than uh, Amazon <laughs> probably, well, Amazon uh, probably isn't cheaper, but if you take the hardware cost mm -hmm. only, but on yeah. board with it. But uh, for, for just trying it out, it might prove simpler and cheaper. And al also, it's not the only company that offers these kinds of services. And I used to run all, all of this in Vagrant on my machine when we long ago started with the approach and didn't even know if we wanted it. And worked uh, pretty well. Nowadays, the, the laptops are way more powerful than the EC2 instances that we usually <laughs> run. All right, but uh, thank you to Marty.